This is CCNA Voice in Tech 226. We're starting Chapter 5, Managing Endpoints and End Users with CME. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. Let's start by looking at the IP phone boot process. The phone goes through several steps before it is fully registered and ready to make and receive calls. The first step is it needs power. This could be provided by a regular power brick plugged into the wall, but more likely it comes from power over ethernet, mainly the 8023AF standard for power over ethernet. After the phone gets power, it goes through a number of steps we'll skip like post power on self-test, booting the operating system, but the next thing it'll do in terms of uh, getting ready to make a call is it does CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol. This allows it to uh, communicate to the switch it's connected to and discover what VLAN it's a member of, in this case, the voice VLAN. It will then use that information, knowing what VLAN it's supposed to be on, to DHCP, a broadcast DHCP, to learn its IP settings. Within the DHCP request, a reply will come back for option 150, in addition to the usual IP address, mask, gateway, that sort of information. There'll be an option 150. Option 150 is the IP address of the TFTP server where the phone can find its configuration file. The phone will now use that IP to reach out to the TFTP server and it will provide the server its MAC address, the MAC address of the phone, as the file name it is requesting. The TFTP server will look that up, and if it has that phone file, it will reply with the settings for the phone. The phone, with those settings in the configuration file, will be an IP address of where the call manager is located. So step five, the phone will reach out to that call manager in an attempt to register. Once registered, the phone will have its um, extension and be ready to send and receive calls. So that essentially is the five step abbreviated process. You could turn this into as many or as few steps as you want. Probably the minimum are the five that you see here. Let's talk about how to build that voice VLAN. So after power over Ethernet that you really have no control over, the phone will use CDP to determine the voice VLAN. This is the configuration to equip the switch with the voice VLAN for the ports the phones are connected to. So assuming we have a phone on port 15, we would put this port in access mode. We would then assign a voice VLAN. In this example, it's VLAN 10. And if we have a PC that happens to ever get connected through the phone, daisy chained through the phone on the same port 15, that PC or printer or whatever device we daisy chained through the phone would be dropped into VLAN 20. So the phone will get assigned VLAN 10 and the ancillary device daisy chained through the phone, if it exists, would go into VLAN 20. We also don't want to forget to assign span entry port fast since the phone boots so rapidly, we need to make sure the port comes up and is active quickly. Next thing we need to have is a DHCP server. We could equip this in the router or the switch uh, simply by following these configuration commands. We would create a pool, any name that starts with an ASCII character like PDX phones for Portland phones would be appropriate. We then need to define the network that the DHCP server is serving addresses out of. In this case, we have a 1010 network that's slash 16. We need to define the default gateway with the default router command. In this case, we just use the first IP address of the range, which would have to be the address you have configured on the router for this network. It's all just very example review of your networking skills. This is the key one you've never done before, is setting an option 150. This tells the phone where it can find its TFTP server. So option 150 literally means here's the IP address of the TFTP server. You may optionally want to say a DNS server, and I added another option I like, but is not covered in your book. You'll see that in purple. Option 42, which is the location of a network time protocol server. 
So if you have an NTP server, you can provide it to your end devices using DHCP. The next thing we need to configure is the TFTP server. So we go in the router and we have to type the command TFTP server over and over for every file we want to serve. We then need to provide the file system where that file was located. That's almost always flash zero unless you have multiple compact flash cards or you're using a USB storage stick. We then have to provide the path within that file system, the directory and subdirectories of where that file is located, and finally the file name that we want to share or serve. At the end here, alias is the same thing as shortcut. In Windows, you'd call this a shortcut. Alias is the common name or the name without any path information of the file. We could give the, we could call this file simple one, and it would still go to the term 61.default.loads file because we're providing an alias or shortcut. And if you've created a window shortcut, you know you can give it any name you like. It doesn't have to be named the same as the directory or file it points to. For our purposes in this class, and normally in normal usage, we always make the alias the same as the file name. Notice the alias is going to be that, uh, that common name that the TFTP client asks for. TFTP is a protocol where the client has no capacity to specify the path or directory or subdirectory. And so all that can be passed through the TFTP protocol is just a file name. And so that's the purpose of the alias is to link the file name to the actual location the file is located at. Now that we've done this, we have to configure CME. For the first time on a router, you're going to have to set up a source address. This is the address that the phones will be attempting to register at. It is recommended you use a loopback address on your router for this purpose. You could use a physical interface like the Ethernet port, but if that interface were down or unavailable, the phones would be unable to register. You also have to specify the maximum number of phones and phone lines, which is MaxDN, that this router will accept. It is a good idea not to set this overly high because it uses resources. When you set, say in this example, Max Phones 35, it will use up RAM and partition it off for 35 phones, even if you only have three. So if you're only planning on three phones, you might want to set this to five. Uh, it's a good idea to set it a little higher maybe than, than you're um, planning on, but not too much higher. You can always come back and uh, massage these numbers upwards or downwards as you like. Let's look at the configuration for a single line phone. That would be a phone with one button with one phone number. So we would create an ePhone DN, that's the phone number. You have to give it a reference number, in this case one, it can be any number, one to whatever. Typically we just do them one, two, three, four, irregardless of the number we assign it. We're going to assign this phone DN uh, the extension number 1001 or 1001. The next thing we need to do is assign this extension number to a phone device. We do that with an ePhone command. So ePhone 1 will be our phone device. We have to identify the device by its MAC address. So that way, when the phone registers to this call manager, the call manager will search through the ePhones to find the one that matches the MAC address of the device registering. We will now assign button 1 on this ePhone device, the ePhone DN1. So its button 1 is a physical button on the phone and that's being assigned to ePhone DN1. If this was ePhone DN50, we would type button 1 colon 50. Let's look at our dual line example. In a dual line situation, we have more than one button on the phone and we want to have more than one phone number, one per button. So we create several phone numbers with our ePhone DN command, in this case DN2 and DN3. 
we now need to come down and create an e-phone and then assign those two numbers, one to each button. Button one will be assigned ePhone DN2, and button two will be assigned ePhone DN3. Next example is looking at how do you put two numbers on one button. There is a time when you want to have more than one number ring to the same line. So we create an ePhone DN, in this case ePhone DN4, and we're going to assign it two numbers. So this is commonly used when you have an internal extension and also an external DID number. In this case, we have an external number and an internal extension. Notice we are just using one button. So if you dialed 1004, it would ring to button one on ePhone 4. If you dialed 360-992-1004, it would also ring to button one on ePhone 4. Let's take a look at putting two numbers on the same line. In this case, it's not the same thing as two physical numbers on one line. This is the command dual line, which allows this one line to accept uh, multiple calls at one time. This is necessary if you plan to do um, hold or you want to do call waiting or call transfer or pretty much any advanced call feature, you will need to add dual line. That allows the one line to have one call coming in while a second one's going out, that sort of thing. One question that may arise, you noticed in the prior slides, we covered assigning DNs to an ePhone. And in every case, the ePhone has to be specified by its MAC address. You can locate the MAC address on the box the phone comes in. If you happen to have the cardboard box the phone is in, the MAC address is on a label on the exterior of the box. Most people no longer have those boxes. So once the phone is set up like it is in our lab environment, you'll want to look on the bottom of the phone. Flip the phone over and you will see a sticker on the bottom middle of the phone with the MAC address. Additionally, if the phone is powered on, you can press the menu and settings menu and see the MAC address there. These are two that are not covered in the book. You could look it up on your DHCP server. All DHCP reservations have the MAC address listed. Additionally, you could look it up in the switch that the phone is cabled to. If you wanted to just look at the hardware cam table, you could look for that port and see what MAC address was um, learned on that port, and that would be the phone's MAC address. So several ways you can locate the MAC address. These are on the test. Let's talk a little bit about CCP. We talked about this in Chapter 4, our last chapter. I won't say much about it. I'm not a big fan of GUI configuration tools for Call Manager Express because they are limited in nature. But one feature of CCP that is quite useful is the bulk import wizard. This allows you to add many phone devices at once. Essentially, it's like importing an Excel spreadsheet or a comma delimited file, and you can import a whole file of phones. And it's very helpful for initial configuration of, a, of an office area with perhaps hundreds of phones. One other point I wanted to make about CCP is unlike the command line interface, when you type at the command line interface commands, they take effect immediately. In CCP, they do not. You need to hit the refresh button to get those commands to take effect. In summary, for this chapter, we looked at the IP phone boot process. Additionally, we reviewed some networking skills. Then we covered the concepts and configuration for ePhones and ePhone DNs. And finally, we talked about how CCP can be used to manage a name directory, phones, and users.